But I tell you, it's, it's really incredible what we can discover in God's Word when we're faithful to read it. Amen? When we dive into God's Word and we have an open heart and we say, God, speak into my life. It's, it's really incredible how God can speak to us through the reading and the preaching and the studying of God's Word. And I pray that for all of us here this morning. I want to start off by asking a question, and the question is this. So how many of you are stirred up over what you see in our world today? What we see in our world today, the things that we see in our world today. You know, I know that's a bit of a rhetorical question, and I didn't expect you to just stand up and just start giving me answers. But the reality is, if you look at that, if you look at that question, what is it about what's happening in our community? What is it about what's happening in our nation? What is it about that, that's happening in our world today? There's no doubt that there have been times, at least in the most recent history, where emotions just sort of swell as you think about what's going on in our world today. For some, it may be anger. There's a lot of people in, in our world today that are just very angry over the state of how things are in our nation and in our communities and maybe even in our churches. People will get angry oftentimes and, and, and they voice their, their feelings based off of the anger that they feel. For others, it may be fear. Many people just fear what's going on in the world today and fear what's going on around them and fear what, uh, the, the things that they are so uncertain about. And, and so fear can often be one of those emotions that sort of springs up and sort of grabs hold of who we are. And, and oftentimes fear can lead to just being disabled to do anything just because of the fear that we feel about what's going on around us. Maybe for some of us here today, it's frustration. You know, frustration is not really anger. It's, it's not really fear. It's something else that we deal with. And we look at situations in our life and we feel as though things are just out of our control and yet it doesn't stop. It, things just keep going. And as we see those things going on around us, we feel frustrated. Maybe because we can't do a lot about the things that we see. But let me ask you this this morning. When was the last time you experienced brokenness? Brokenness where your heart ached over all those things that are going on. Where you set aside momentarily anger and fear and frustration. And you looked at the world. And as you looked at the world, you just realized the world was lost and dark and hopeless and because of all of that that you saw, you begin to experience a sadness that existed in your heart. And as you opened your eyes and you took note of everything that was going on, what you begin to feel was a brokenness for the people that are living in these situations, especially those living without Jesus. Have you experienced brokenness lately? When was the last time you went to the Lord in prayer and prayed for those in our church, prayed for those in our community, prayed for those in our nation and around the world because you were broken for them? Can I just say this this morning, that you were made for this. You were made to feel broken over the lostness of the world, the darkness of the world. You were made, you were created to feel broken for people who are living their life outside of Christ Jesus. And here's the reality as a believer and a follower of Christ. You were sent to them to take the gospel message that they would hear the hope of Christ and find that which you know to be the answer to making your way through this thing called life with joy and peace and, and all of the things that are a great gift from our holy and righteous God. But it begins with brokenness. It begins with brokenness. You know, in the book of Acts, we see an incredible record of the history of the early church. It tells us of how 
the disciples, they went out and they began to share the gospel and they began to share the good news of, of Christ Jesus with anyone who would really listen. And we begin to read through the gospel and we see some incredible stories that are just so encouraging to us to, to think about. That's where we came from. People who were faithful and obedient going out and sharing the good news of Christ. And, and, and over the, the, the thousands of years that have experienced since those days is, is people whose lives have been transformed by Christ Jesus. And, and, and because of that, they continue sharing the gospel until one day you and I heard the gospel and we believed in who Jesus was and our lives were radically changed. Amen? All right, that's half of you. I just want to know how many of you are lost and how many of you are saved, so I, I know what to address here this morning. And so we have this beautiful historical document, if you will. And there was a time when Paul, the Apostle Paul, was on his second missionary journey. And he was going from place to place and he was planting churches and in places like Philippi and Thessalonica and different places. And, and, and so he was, he was planting these great works and, and people were getting saved and churches were being formed and, and people were growing in their relationship with the Lord. And, and he went from city to city. But it was during these times that he was also sort of criticized and and, and he was oftentimes even run out of town, these towns where he preached the good news of Christ Jesus. Here the Apostle Paul being broken for the lostness goes in sharing the hope of Christ, but not all would accept that message. And so Paul would leave and he would go to the next city. And there's a story there in Acts chapter 17 where Paul, he arrives in Athens. And that's not the home of the Georgia Bulldogs I'm talking about. Not a bad place, but he comes to Athens there in Greece, and, and he is approaching the city, and he has gone out ahead of his friends, and, and as he arrives, he, he, he shows up, and, and he's, he, he's sort of taken an evaluation of what he sees. He knows his friends will come in the next few days, and the Apostle Paul, he's sort of taken all of this in. And we read in verse 16 something really powerful about what Paul experienced as he looked out over this city called Athens. It says that now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him and he saw a city that was full of idols. I want you to imagine for just a moment what's taking place. Paul has gone from place to place. He shared the gospel. He's seen lives transformed. And now he comes to Athens. And as he stands before Athens and he sort of looks around, what he sees are all these idols that have been fashioned by man's hands. And he realizes the, the art, if you will, of idol worship that exists in this city. And he begins to realize that there are people who are worshiping those things which have really no meaning in their life. And it says here in the scripture that his heart was provoked, his spirit, his soul was stirred over what he took notice of in the city. And what the word of God is describing for us is a brokenness that fell on the apostle Paul's heart. As he started contemplating just how lost the city was and just how lost these people were and the reality that they desperately needed to hear the truth of the gospel. He was overcome with brokenness. But it was in that moment... It was in that moment when Paul stood there and took notice of all these idols that God began to prepare him for one of the most important messages that he would preach. 
Turn with me, if you will, this morning to Acts chapter 17. We're going to begin at the very next verse, chapter 7, or excuse me, uh, we're, we're going to skip a few verses and go to verse 22, Acts chapter 17, starting with verse 22. And what we're going to see here is how the Apostle Paul engaged with the people of Athens. And we're going to see something really remarkable as we look into this. If, if we were to read, starting with verse 16 to verse 22, we would get a real good understanding of what's taking place because what happens next is that Paul goes down into the city and it says in the scripture that he goes to the marketplace. And it seems that this would make sense because that's where people are doing life, isn't it? That's where people are going and they're doing their shopping and they're, they're doing their trading and they're, they're buying the things that they need. And so it was a busy place. It was a bustling place. And so Paul says, well, why don't we just start where the people are? And he goes into the city and we begin to see as Paul goes into Athens that he begins to preach the gospel. And Paul preaches the gospel. And it says that the people were intrigued. They, they heard the good news of Christ. And they didn't really know what to make of it. And so they, they, they wanted to hear more. They wanted to understand. So they, bought, uh, they brought Paul to Oropagus. And, and this was a place where the council could meet and debate and and even hold trials. This was a place where when people brought ideas into the city that they could come to this place, to this council, and they could stand there and they could sort of talk through the different issues that they were dealing with. And so these people in the marketplace who were listening to Paul, they bring him to this place. And they say, Listen, you gotta hear what this guy has to say. I, I, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but this is pretty intriguing, and, I, and, and we just want to hear more, but we, wanna, we wanted to bring him to you guys who are the, the ones who are more the intellectuals, the one who's, whose whole life centers around debating your different philosophies and ideas and religions. So they bring Paul there. And starting at verse 22, we read this. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and I observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in the temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. I don't know why... I'm not really sure why, but this, this passage, it kind of reminds me of a pep rally. I had to ask some of the young people this morning, do they still do pep rallies at school? And they were like, oh yeah. And they said, why? I said, well, I'm going to talk about that this morning, but I want to make sure somebody doesn't say, Pastor David, they quit that 40 years ago. Nobody holds a pep rally anymore, but but I, but I do, I, I look at this passage and it sort of has this feel to a pep rally. I used to love pep rallies, by the way. I loved them because I got out of class, right? They would just sort of cut the day short. They would bring you in and the whole school would assemble for a pep rally. And we all knew what it was about. It was about to encourage our players to go out and win the game, you know. And so we would come in there and the band would come in. They would be playing their music and everybody's jumping and shouting. I'm just, like I say, I'm just glad to be out of class. I'm glad that it's over for the week. You know, and so there I was, and the band would come in there, and they'd kind of get everybody going, and, 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 and so as they, as they did this, you know, then the cheerleaders would come out, and they would cheer a couple of cheers, and everybody would kind of go along with that, and then, you know, the coach would come up, and he would, he would just start speaking, and he would talk about how he was going to, you know, win the game, you know, we need our fans to support us, and all these things, and it was to sort of, it was to sort of inform us of what was about to take place, 
and how we needed to get sort of behind that. Nowadays, I don't really go to pep rallies. I just stand in front of the TV and scream for my dogs, right? My wife thinks I'm crazy. She won't even come into the room sometimes because she says I get too loud. One day she comes in there and she says, you know they can't hear you, right? As a dog fanatic, I looked at her and I said, you don't know what you're talking about. They certainly can hear me. They just won 62 to nothing. I think they heard every word I said. I don't get to go to these pep rallies anymore, but the reality is Paul is sort of brought to the assembly, right? And it's, it's as though Paul just has this boldness that, that we haven't seen before. Paul, he comes, and, and I think it's really interesting, and he starts off and he says this. He says, you know what? He says, he says I, I notice you're very religious people. In other words, you're very spiritual and the reason that he can say this is because there are the, all these idols with all these names of gods all over the city. And he can see this. And so he knows that they're supernatural believing people. They believe in the supernatural. They believe in a, maybe a higher power. And so he, he says, I perceive you're very religious. You have all these idols. But I've also noticed that one of the idols that you have carved out for yourself is to the unknown God. And I love what Paul says. He says, I've been brought here to tell you about that one. The one that you don't know because he's the one that matters. So let's dive into this. Let's look at what it is that Paul has to say here this morning. Notice in verse 22, this is what Paul says. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. So Paul starts off letting them know, I recognize that you are religious. You are spiritual people. And in other words, they, they believed in some sort of this higher power. They were, they were religious. But you see, Paul realizes something that is very important, and he's going to get to that. And I think this is why he pointed out their religion before he gets to the truth of who Christ is. But what Paul knows is, the, is that the problem with religion in and of itself is worthless. It doesn't matter that you are religious. These were very religious people, but they didn't know the one true God. And so Paul wants to start off by revealing to them that he understands that they're religious and quite honestly that's a good starting place because if if at least you believe in the supernatural if you believe in a higher power you can begin to share the gospel and the truth of Christ without people just completely denying that any of that exists but he wants them to know there's a problem with religion I think it's interesting Colossians 2 8 says this it says see to it that no one takes you, by philo takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. So we see in Colossians why Paul would have felt like the way he felt when he was speaking to the men of Athens is because anything outside of Jesus Christ is not a good religion. Religion may be religion, but without Christ, it's not the gospel, and there's no hope in religion. Paul says here, he says, he, he point, in, in this one passage as he's writing to the Colossians, he says, he points to several different ways that we can be religious. One is by way of philosophy. Philosophy is the study of knowledge. And quite honestly, this is what Athens held deeply to the study of knowledge this sort of this sort of worship of the mind the way we think the ideas that we craft and the things that we can come up with and so here Paul wants them to know he's he's very much aware that they are they have built their entire belief system on religion he mentions another one in Colossians passage he mentions human tradition Human tradition deals with the ceremony or the rituals or the rule following or rule keeping that, that often people practice. And you can, 
certainly practice those things without knowing God. In fact, if I could be honest here this morning, I believe that what, much of what we see in the Bible Belt is nothing more than human traditional religion and not a following of Christ Jesus. I go to these places like Boston and New York and they say, man, you got it easy down there in the South. I'm like, man, I got it hard because everybody thinks they're saved. People are living their life religiously going to church and practicing the things that their grandmother and their mothers taught them, but they don't know God any more than the people of Athens knew God. And that makes it a dangerous place to have a false assurance that you know Jesus when in fact you don't. And so here we see where Paul, he's, he's helping them understand that these human traditions, they give the appearance of devotion, but ultimately they have little to do with Jesus, with Christ. The problem with this is that those who are religious will eventually ask, so what's the point of all this? And the reason they'll ask that is because religion doesn't do anything to satisfy the soul. Going to church will ultimately get boring if Christ is not the object of your worship. Going to church will, will, will ultimately be not satisfying because Jesus isn't the object of your worship. And so the same thing that Paul once shared with the men of Athens should really be shared with us today. Because too many people practice religion without knowing the known God. And so Paul, he, he, he's speaking to these guys and he's wanting them to understand that, that this is something that he is aware of. He's aware of their religion, but the problem with religion is you can be religious and not know God. So he continues. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. They worship so many gods that they went ahead and put up an altar for any that they might not know. And so there's no reason, there's no, there's certainly a reason for us to understand how Paul would have felt looking out over the city and why his heart would have been broken over the things that he saw. His heart was broken over the lostness, and so he, he began to tell people about Jesus. Paul intentionally engaged those who were living their life aimlessly. He intentionally began to engage uh, with people whose lives were hopeless. He began to engage with those who were without Christ. I've been praying a lot these days. Way back before we put this series together, you know, obviously I go to the Lord and I pray, God, what is it that you would have me to preach? What kind of series do we need to, to preach? And there's a lot of different ways you could go about that. I mean, you know, uh, just like next week, we're going to start one on the book of Revelation. Totally different than what this one has been for us. There's a lot of different directions you could go, but, but in my time just spending with God, I, 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 I spent so much time praying because God, I said, God, what, what is it that we need to hear? What is it that, that I need to hear? I don't know if you're aware of this, but every sermon I come and preach to you, I've already preached to myself about 10 times, and believe you me, some of them I don't want to bring to you because they hurt so bad, right? It, some of them are just so convicting. I mean, I, I'm just working through it and and I'm like, God, this is, this is exactly what I need to hear, even though there may be tremendous amounts of conviction on my life. Oftentimes, it's the opposite of that. It's, it's in times where I need encouragement, and, and I'm preaching through the different series that we have, and I'm just so encouraged by the presence of God in my life. But as I'm preaching, as I'm praying through what we would be preaching for 
six or seven weeks and putting this series together, I found myself really feeling burdened by what's going on in our world today. But even more importantly, burdened by what's going on in the church today. And I'm not talking so much specifically about Crosspoint. I'm talking about the big C. I'm talking about the church. And, and you, you look around and you just you wonder if people are just bought into religion and not to Jesus. And it breaks my heart. And, I, and, I, and, and, and so in the process of putting this thing together, I find myself, God, just crying out to God, God, what are we made for? What is the purpose of our existence? Why were we created and quite honestly, you know all the answers. They're all in the scriptures, but we seem to forget. We live our life day by day by day, and for the most part, we leave God out of it. We leave him completely out of it. Oh, we toss a prayer at dinner when we're gathered around the table. We read our devotion on our phone out the, work, all out the door on the way to work. We come to church and we look at our watch and wonder when he's going to get done so we can go eat. The lines are going to get long. If a, And I wonder, I wonder how many of us are practicing religion and not devotion to Christ. And again, I'm speaking to myself as much as I am to you. Paul is addressing people that don't know God, but we're supposed to know him. We're supposed to know him. We come in here week after week and we celebrate the name of Jesus. We hold up the banner of Christianity high and we say, that's who we are. That's who we are. So here's what I've been praying for. Number one. I've been praying, and this specifically for us. I've been praying for us. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for our staff. I've been praying for me. But number one, this is what I've been praying for. And I want you to please write these down and join me in praying for these things. But I've been praying that our hearts would be awakened for the spiritual things. Our hearts are attuned to the worldly things. I'm certain of that but are they attuned to the spiritual things to the things of God and so I'm praying that our hearts would be awakened some people might call it a revival God bring revival start with me come into my life bring revival into my heart but God awaken who we are as believers and followers of Christ we need your spirit in our life we need you in our life we may not can do anything about the circumstances we see in our nation, but one thing we can do is pray. But God, it's going to have to begin with a burden. It's going to have to begin with a burden for what's going on around us. It's going to have to begin with a burden for our own lives to be transformed by the Spirit of God. Bring revival in our hearts. Ephesians 5, 14 says this, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I'm praying for an awakening. An awakening in, in our midst. A, a revival, a, a, a coming of the Holy Spirit and sweeping through our lives like we've never seen before, where our minds would be on who Christ is and not on the things of this world and not on the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but just believing and having faith in a holy and righteous God to do what he does best. And that is change lives. That's what I'm praying for. I want you to pray with me. Pray that God would move like we've never seen before here's number two i pray that hearts will be moved by a burden for the lost around us if we're going to pray that it would begin with us then we should also be praying for god to save the lost 
In other words, praying for a harvest, praying for God to, to move and show us what he wants to do in our community and in our midst. Pray for the lost. And finally, number three, I'm praying that we would be compelled to engage with others about Jesus. Here's the thing. If we have a burden for the lost and we're praying for the lost, then here's the, here's the thing that we need to understand. We need to go to the lost. Amen? Amen? We need to help people. Let me tell you, your friends, your family, your coworkers, your fellow students, they're hurting in this world. And maybe you're hurting too, and that's where the awakening and the revival needs to take place first. But... But we're all hurting by what we see going on in our world. But I pray also that as God does a tremendous work in our own hearts, that we would have the boldness, the boldness to go out into our community, beginning with those whom we know, and saying, can I tell you about someone who transformed my life and he can transform your life? Because he's been doing it for over 2,000 years. And his name is Jesus. Be bold about who we proclaim. His name is Jesus. We need to tell people about Jesus. We need to tell people about Jesus. Sometimes I wonder if we don't share what God is doing in our life because God isn't big enough in our life. I don't know about you. That's what he's kind of laid on my heart. God, are you big enough in my life that I would go out and continue to share the gospel every single waking minute of my life? I know he's big enough. Is he big enough to me? Hebrews eleven six 6 says this. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. What do you believe this morning? Where do you place your faith and your trust this morning? Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In California, up in the mountains, there's a Christian camp and it's near a place called Hume Lake. In fact, I think it's called Hume. <laughs> but there's this place that is a, is a Christian camp. And several years back, and it's been quite a few now, Linnell and I had the opportunity to join a couple of friends and go to Hume Lake and just see what God is doing there. And it was really amazing what was happening at this place. But there's a big sign there that exists and it's down by the lake. It's not, you know, as, as you walk to the lake and you got this beautiful view of the mountains and you got all these just trails where you can sort of get off and spend some time with God. But as you walk down to the lake, there's this big sign and it just says, God is. God is. You know, for many people in this world, including those who may profess to be believers, they may say, well, what is God? Who is God? God is what? We shouldn't have to do that, should we? Because I believe when we really know who God is, it's much easier for us to just walk up to a sign like that, God is, and go, yep, he sure is. God is. I mean, we should get that, right? We should just understand that. There shouldn't have to be an explanation that comes with that. God is. He is what? He is everything. He's absolutely everything. He's absolutely everything to me. He should be absolutely everything to you. God is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Shouldn't be something we have to think about. Shouldn't be something that we have to process or try to add words to. That should do it. Amen? Amen. That should do it. So what do you say this morning? Do you say God is? Are you still trying to figure that all out? <laughs>
You know, tonight we're going to have an amazing time of worship as we come and gather together, and we're going to we're going to be participating in the Lord's Supper together. I love the Lord's Supper, like Jordan was saying earlier. It's just such an amazing, incredible time when we have that opportunity to do that. But my hope and prayer is this morning that you would begin right now preparing your hearts. Preparing your hearts. If you're coming tonight, and I hope you do, then I hope you would begin to just spend some time in prayer and say, God, just... This is the areas I need work in my life. This is what I need to confess to you. This is where I've been. This is what I need. Just just believe that God is and turn to him and ask him to begin to prepare your hearts. If you can't be here tonight, and I get that, maybe some of you can't. But your prayer can be the same. God, begin this morning working in my life. Begin this morning helping me to understand what I need to understand to fully and completely know you. I don't know that there's any of us here today that want to continue to worship an unknown God. So ask God to help you understand. Come to this altar and pray this morning. Thank God for what he's doing. Worship God as we stand and we sing together the lyrics that proclaim his greatness. Let us not walk out of here unchanged. Because I believe God wants to do something special in your life. And I pray you want the same.